This program is a video presentation via Zoom of the Civil War Roundtable of the District of Columbia. Founded in 1951, the Roundtable hosts monthly presentations at a location near Washington, D.C., more recently at the Fort Myer Officers Club. For more information, go to www.cwrtdc.org. Let me go ahead and start the introduction. She's a historian and several, an author of several books in Missouri history and a uh, professional ge genealogist. And uh, for over 40 years of experience uh, as an archivist that volunteers for local institutions, um, uh, her research on Archer's story has taken her from Missouri to Virginia and Washington, D.C., using documents and covered even in the National Archives. And I know that that can happen. Uh, talking to some of the librarians there, they say they're really surprised about how some of the materials that they have are never checked out and they wish some people would. And I guess uh, Doris has done that over there. And uh, she's working with, the, uh, with Archer's family, which is really interesting. And I had no idea that um, Archer Alexander was uh, related to Muhammad Ali. Um, and she uh, also works as a consultant on international base, on an international basis is in the, and is the executive director of the Missouri Germans Consortium. Um, everyone, please welcome Doris, Kevin, Frankie. I, I wanna thank everybody for um, joining us tonight and um, Kurt for inviting me. So a few years ago, uh, Jonathan Eig's book on Muhammad Ali was published. And he was sharing how Archer Alexander was Ali's great, great, great grandfather. I'd been writing Missouri history at that time for way over 30 years. And a friend was sharing the news and he knew I'd be interested. And I commented about how this was a Missouri slave. And it was about that time that uh, Keith Winstead, um, who's on tonight and joining us. And later on, I'd like to introduce that Keith Winstead asked me for help locating the grave of his ancestor, Archer Alexander. Well, I figured that he'd read William Greenleaf Elliott's book. Uh, the title is Archer Alexander from Slavery to Freedom and that he'd read that book too. And I wondered why he couldn't find the location. Well, that's a whole nother story that I'm not going to get into tonight, but that's when I began this journey. That it has taken me from St. Louis, St. Charles. St. Charles is where I live, um, which is um, west of St. Louis, and um, to Virginia, to Lexington, to investigate the roots. You can't write a biography of someone without being there. Um, up to Washington, D.C., to the monument, um, and into the National Archives, and all the way to the basement of the St. Louis City Hall and the Missouri Historical Society. What I discovered was that the story that we do know was only the tiniest fragment of the whole story. And as I dug deeper and deeper into the original documents, the journals, family histories, and a lot more, I discovered that there was a lot more, um, and it was a much larger story than Elliot's little book shared. It's 88 pages. And some of the details had been changed. I began to feel that a big injustice had been done to this man and that this is a story that we all need to hear. So I wanna give a word of caution because many believe that they know Archer Alexander's story. Several years of research have enabled me to peel back the many layers of distortion, concealment and charades and what has been told. And I can reveal a story now that is the essence of Missouri in the Civil War. The Civil War in Missouri was definitely a different war and different from what was occurring in the East. Being a border state and about the furthest you could get from Washington, DC, we sort of have our own way of doing things here in Missouri. Some would say we were a Confederate state that was occupied by the Union Army. And technically they were correct. What they may not realize that those that occupied 
actually lived here too. And I'm going to explain that. Tonight, I'm going to share a previously untold story and a different story about this slave. I wanna explain Missouri. In 1863, Missouri was a hotbed of abolitionists um, and Southern sympathizers. Its population was a boiling stew of families from Virginia, Kentucky, um, Tennessee, and they crafted a rue of a slave state, but history had added an immigrant population from Germany, flavored with Irish and other families from the Eastern states of Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Ohio. The state had become a full-bodied stew in its own right by the beginning of the Civil War. And in the winter of 1862, the state was boiling over. Its application for statehood had cooked for three years Talmadge had peppered it with an amendment for us to be a free state, but that wouldn't do. Senator and Speaker of the House, Henry Clay, that does have connection to Archer Alexander's story in other ways. Henry Clay had put the final touch to the whole thing with the Missouri Compromise, which would allow Missouri to enter as a slave state. The state's residents like Thomas Hart Benton and John B. Pittman, a Revolutionary War hero from Kentucky, had come from Virginia, and from Kentucky with their property. What really happened was a slow simmer that had become a full bone boil, and it was a full blown boil as known as the Civil War. Before that, in 1829, um, a small book was published in Germany about Missouri. It was called A Report on, the, on a Journey to the Western States of North America. It was an attorney named Godfrey Duden. That book alone, that small book, brought 40,000 Germans to the already 60,000 residents in the 1830 decade alone. German abolition immigrants were anti-slavery, abolitionist, and they would entirely change the demographics of our state. Um, it was more than just the human rights issues that made them and that they were fleeing. It was also the issues of free labor and the wealth that, um, that was allowed to slave owners. They represented the same aristocracy that the Germans had left and the same oppression that they had faced and left Germany over. They left Germany because of these conditions and they didn't wanna see it happen in Missouri. One such immigrant was um, a German named Arnold Kreckel. He had come to Missouri at the age of 17, gone to college here, and um, became an attorney and a state rep and an abolitionist. So Missouri was filling up with others also wishing to come west from states like Massachusetts. And this was changing the demographics of our great city of St. Louis. Education and religion would enlighten our frontier town. Boston-born William Greenleaf Elliott arrived in 1834, bringing the Unitarian Church to St. Louis. He was also a public leader, very much into education, founded the Washington University here in St. Louis and um, introduced public schools. The louder the German abolitionist would get, the harder the slave owners would fight to retain their way of life. Now I'm gonna explain the Fugitive Slave Act. And this takes a bit, but it's very important to Archer Alexander's story, which I'm sure you'll understand. The Fugitive Slave Act was a reflection of national politics, which was why the freedom suit of Dred Scott, which was initiated here in St. Louis in 1847, was actually won in Missouri, but eventually defeated in the Supreme Court in 1857. The Fugitive Slave Act passed on September 18, 1850 by Congress was part of what's called the Compromise of 1850, which actually negated the compromise that allowed Missouri to become a state. The act required that slaves be returned to their owners even if they were in a free state. The act also made the federal government responsible for finding and returning and trying any escaped slaves. But Missouri is not a free state, it's a slave state. So you begin to understand 
that there's a little bit of conflict of what exactly are we here? We're both. As the Fugitive Slave Act read, be it further enacted that it shall be the duty of all the marshals and the deputy marshals to obey and execute every single warrant precepts issued under the provisions of this act when to them directed. And should any marshal or deputy marshal refuse to receive such a warrant or other process when tendered or to use all proper means diligently to ex execute the same, he shall be convicted, evicted of or fined if he does refuses in the sum of $1,000 to the use of such claimant on the motion of such claimant. And after the arrest of the such fugitive by the such marshaler's deputy at any time in his custody, should the fugitive escape, whether with or without the assent of the marshal or the deputy, such marshal will be liable on his bond and prosecuted to the full extent for the full, lab full value of the labor of the said fugitive of the, slate, of the uh, state, territory, or district that he escaped from. You were talking about the insurance on slaves earlier. The better to enable the said commissioners when thus appointed to execute their duties faithfully and efficiently in conformity with the requirements of the Constitution of the United States and of this act, they are hereby empowered. It also um, allowed the execute for the process, the summon to call to their aid, the bystanders, posse of the property proper county and when necessary to ensure a faithful observance of the clause of the constitution it was very much in relation and conforming to the, what they considered the constitution constitutional law any person who shall knowingly and willingly obstruct hinder prevent such claimant his agent or attorney or any persons lawfully assisting him, her, or them from arresting such a fugitive slave from service or labor, either with or without process, um, such fugitive slave from service or labor from um, the custody, that person was also going to be fined and could be arrested and fined and um, also fined $1,000. There was also made it against the law to um, assist any such person um, directly or indirectly to escape from the claimant. He could not, shall not harbor or conceal such fugitive so as to prevent the discovery or arrest of such person. This was also um, all part of the District Court of the United States. So that was the conditions here at that time in 1850. Now, German-born Arnold Kreckel would attend the Republican convention in Chicago that would nominate Abraham Lincoln. St. Louis, it was the only city of its size in the country that was a slave-owning state where the vote went to Lincoln, a friend of the German immigrants. The opening acts of the Civil War in St. Louis occurred in May of 1861. Claiborne Fox Jackson had won his election as governor on an anti-slavery platform in January of 1861, but then immediately retracted that and called for Missouri's Congress to gather and to secede, but it refused to do so. He was forced out in July in St. Louis, uh, knowing that Jackson's troops in, in May there were waiting, wanting to grab arms that had been shipped in, were being held at the arsenal for federal troops. Lyons troops hastily formed and made the first move instead. That day, in, in, um, there were 3,000 federal troops in which over 2,400 of them were Germans. They had been brought in from as far as Cincinnati and Milwaukee, and they moved on Camp Jackson. The first soldier killed was a Union captain who was a Polish German named Blandowski, but there was also 28 civilians who had come to watch and wave at the troops as they marched into the city's streets. St. Louis 
and Missouri would thereafter would remain a union state with slavery for the balance of the war. Soon followed the Battle of Wilson's Creek. Medical care for massive numbers of injured troops required field hospitals. And this would lead to the creation of the Western Sanitary Commission. William Greenleaf Elliott understood the need for hospitals and he made a list of, of what he felt was needed. He shared this with a friend of his, Jesse Benton Fremont. Um, she's the daughter of Missouri's first state senator, uh, one of the two, Thomas Hart Benton. She put it in her own handwriting and her husband, um, John C. Fremont submitted it to Lincoln and it was established as the Western Sanitary Commission in August of 1861 by special order number 159 on September 5th. This commission was a non-governmental organization. It was privately funded. Lincoln had given the commissioners carte blanche in the Western theater, where it not only supported the union troops and their hospital needs, but it supported US color troops and aided fugitives and contraband camps. Lincoln's Confiscation Act from the beginning of the Confederate Army's use of its property to sustain it was a definite advantage for states like Missouri. While Union troops occupied the states, a guerrilla war was being fought by Southern sympathizers. They often hid their allegiance. The confiscation, confiscation acts were laws passed by the United States Congress during the Civil War with the intention of freeing the slaves still held by Confederate forces in the South. The first Confiscation Act um, of 1861 authorized the confisc confiscation of any Confederate property by Union forces, property being thereby including slaves, this meant that all slaves that fought or worked for the Confederate military were confiscated whenever court proceedings condemned them as property used in order to support the rebellion. The bill passed in the U.S. House of Representatives 60 to 48 and in the Senate 24 to 11. The act was signed into law by President Lincoln August 6, 1861, but that's not where it ended. The Confiscation Act of 1862 was passed on July 17th. It stated that any Confederate official, military or civilian, who did not surrender within 60 days of the act's passage would have their slaves freed in criminal proceedings. However, this act was only ap applicable to Confederate areas that had been occupied by the Union Army. One of the mandates and commissioners that brokered this act was Republican Thomas Elliott of Massachusetts, who's a brother of William Greenleaf Elliott of St. Louis. He had helped broker this. The growing movements towards emancipation was aided by these acts, which eventually led to first the preliminary, which you all know, September 22nd, and the final Emancipation Proclamation in January of 1863. But this does not apply to Missouri. Missouri is not part of this and is one of the states that um, it is exempted from. Lincoln felt it was best to let them decide this for themselves. So what happens is, as I'm going to first read what Elliot wrote. At Archer's home in St. Charles County, close by St. Louis, the center of free soil strength, the current of thought circulated freely. Remember, this is 1885. Trusted as he was, he heard from day to day from those who talked freely in his presence what was going on. He heard it without full comprehension. I don't believe that. 
but with a growing conviction that freedom was his rightful inheritance under the law of Christ. Now in 1862, in that December, a group of slave owners and Confederate sympathizers met at James Naylor's store, which is just down the road from the Pittman home that owns and where Archer Alexander's cabin is. It's in Darden Prairie. It's a township, a little settlement in St. Charles County, Missouri, about 50 miles west of St. Louis. That night, a 56 year old, five foot eight black man named Archer Alexander would overhear the conversation. Known also as Archery, Archer had been born in Rockbridge County, Virginia to a female slave of John Alexander, who had then been inherited by his son, James. James would be among the thousands of Virginians who would move to Missouri with their enslaved property beginning in 1829. The 1820s and the 1830s saw a huge influx of these. When James Alexander died of cholera in 1835, his slaves were absolutely not to be sold by for any reason, but they would be used, be leased out and worked to support the four orphaned Alexander children. They were leased out to many different owners and many different um, businesses over the years. And eventually when um, the one that inherited him had reached of age, he was eventually sold. In the winter of 1862 and 63, um, Archer was one of several slaves owned by a man named Richard Hickman Pittman who um, is considered a haystack secessionist. Thinking on the implications of what he had overheard, Archer had, according to Elliot, learned that a party of men had sawn the timbers of a bridge in that neighborhood over which some companies of Union troops were to pass with view to their destruction. At night, he walked five miles to the house of a well-known Union man through whom the intelligence and, and um, the warning were conveyed to the Union troops who repaired the bridge before crossing it. What actually happened was that Archer shared his knowledge about the bridge and the fact that Pittman and Naylor's neighbor, James Campbell, had arms and ammunition stored in his ice house for use when that bridge failed they shared it with a friend that was a Union troop that was stationed here at Peru Creek Guardhouse. Um, that's the railroad bridge in the background there. The troop's captain apparently shared it with his commanding officer, Lieutenant Arnold Kruckel, and word made its way up the command. Unfortunately, the same soldier's wife was a cousin to Richard Pittman. And it soon became known what Archer had done. He took off for St. Louis with Pittman hot on his trail. Archer had directions via the Underground Railroad network, he knew, to contact a German butcher on Market Street. But before he could even reach it, Pittman caught up with Archer. And after being attacked by um, his master, Archer once again managed to escape. When he reached the butcher's shop, word was sent quickly to the Elliott household. Abby Adams, niece of um, John Adams, President John Adams, um, William Greenleaf Elliott's wife, immediately came to the aid of Archer and brought him home, uh, hiring him to work as a gardener. Her husband, knowing the full implications of aiding a fugitive slave, remember that, immediately reported to the St. Louis Provost Marshal, Frederick Dix, who just also happened to be the Sunday school teacher um, of the area's um, black children at Elliott's Unitarian Church. Dix would issue a temporary order of protection for Archer while Elliott contacted Judge Barton Bates. He's the son of Lincoln's Attorney General, um, Edward Bates. He's a neighbor and a friend of Richard Hickman Pittman. 
Bates was asked to broker an offer to purchase Archer for whatever price um, Pittman would name. But instead, Pittman, knowing where Archer was at this time, instead chose to contact his brother James Pittman in St. Louis and have him swear out that warrant for Archer's arrest. Now knowing where Archer was hiding, James Pittman took the sheriff, St. Louis City Sheriff, to Elliot's home where they recaptured Archer. After nearly bludgeoning him to death in front of Elliot's six-year-old son, Christopher. Pittman and the sheriff took off in their wagon with Archer, threw him in the local jail, the slave jail, on Gracial Street. He was to be sold south the next morning. Elliot had been away from the home teaching at Washington University, and he returned home to learn what had happened. He immediately let Dix know what had happened to Archer, and Dix was furious. He contacted the sheriff involved, who swore that he did not know about the order of protection and had sent men to retrieve or, um, Archer. Now, at that point, too, I mean, he swears that out. He did get the $1,000 fine. Pittman and the sheriff were both arrested. The depositions and hearings soon revealed Archer's heroism. Bates, Judge Barton Bates, would actually attest to Pittman's treasonous behavior. Then, on September 24th, 1863, Archer Alexander, a Negro, aged 47 years, 5 foot 8 inches high, black color, whose last master was R. Hickman Pittman of the County of St. Charles, State of Missouri, is hereby declared to be an emancipated slave and a free man by virtue of the proclamation of the President of the United States, made the 1st of January, 1863. Now that's the Emancipation Proclamation. But it's also under the provisions of the Act of the Congress of July 17, 1862, which is the Confiscation Act, and for important services to the United States military forces and the disloyalty of his master, as you can see there. Now, in April of 1876, on the 11th anniversary of the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, a memorial named the Emancipation Monument that was fully paid for by the former enslaved was erected in Washington Park in Washington, D.C. Archer Alexander is that enslaved man that you see that has truly broken his own chains and with President Lincoln is rising as he recognizes the freedoms he has obtained. That is a story in itself that I'll save for another time. Now, Keith Winstead's ancestor, Archer, well, he um, is part of one of the most important memorials. And we would not know anything of this story though, if it weren't for William Greenleaf Elliot. Today, we like to go on about how stories are whitewashed, or we don't get the accurate stories. This was a person that we actually barely knew anything of, yet he was representing slavery on this very important monument. One that his own people had put there too. Archer truly deserves a lot more to this story and one we really need to hear. It's difficult because so many of these details about Archer Alexander have been changed by someone other than the author known in order for the book to be published in 1885. So there's really an untold story. Thank you very much. Uh, that was that was wonderful. Thank you, Doris, and uh, truly appreciate it. Um, excellent presentation. There are so many facets to this story. Um, the it's not just the story of 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 a slave in the simple story of one slave. The fact that this man is born a slave in Virginia is part of the huge influx 
of, of Virginians and Kentuckians that made up Missouri and, and created our state. Um, part of the caravan that um, Archer comes to Missouri in 1829, um, that is part of the cruelty when part of Archer's children are, are left behind in Louisville, thereby creating the branch of the family that is Muhammad Ali um, and Keith Winstead. So there's that part of the story. He spends 30 years of life as a slave here in Missouri and the events in his life during that time and what he participated in, those are amazing stories in itself. And one of the reasons is, is because of the people that he was surrounded by. These weren't, um, um, Judge Barton Bates um, is, is a highly prominent uh, Missouri judge and part of the family that, he, he, these are people who's related to Governor Gamble, um, Bates and all kinds of important national figures. Um, there's just so many parts to this story. William Greenleaf Elliott and the story of the Western Sanitary Commission, that is so often misunderstood. Um, yes, the commission, the uh, members um, are white. Uh, I would agree with that. At that time, that was the um, makeup of the commission, but who they were working with and who they were working to help and what they were doing, um, that's, an important facet of it. That is why when Charlotte Scott's uh, request for the monument got passed to their behalf, that is why they were able to secure the funds as quickly as they did. Um, then there comes the point to where after Archer has passed away and Elliot wants to write the book, um, he writes this book originally for his own children and he just wants the story to be told in that manner. I will tell you that I do know, and I have documented for a fact that that was his original intention. And people um, began to um, talk to him about it and he had considerations about publishing it. He felt that it would help people understand what had happened in Missouri. He couldn't get the book published. He passed it, he shared it with a friend, and it was actually that friend who knew Archer's background and Archer's story and knew the people who were involved that you couldn't write such a book. Oh, yes, in 2021, it would be hot off the presses immediately. But at that point, no, Elliot's um, book could not be used um, to be accused of slander and his reputation would be damaged as well. So um, a friend actually um, submitted it and to the publishers in, in Boston and the name was selected by that friend as well. So there's just so much to the story that the little book um, by Elliot, which is great because we wouldn't know the story otherwise at all um, is actually been changed so much. Well, it's, it's as you suggested, there's so much interconnection between uh, cultures and people and, you know, history uh, that it's pretty amazing. And it's, it's important to, um, to know that, all the facts. Um, um, and um, I know we have some people in our, on our, um, in our membership that have tried to protect the statue from being taken down because it is still misunderstood. And I, I'm not sure if we have anybody here today, but if somebody could uh, speak to the fact that um, they've been there trying to explain to, uh, to folks that have been at the Washington Park, I guess, is it still Washington Park or is it uh, now renamed something else? But um, it's so far, it's still there. Yeah, the it's statue is Lincoln at Lincoln Park. Park. Kurt, it's Lincoln Park. Lincoln okay. Park, yes, excuse me. But um, I do know that Marsha Cole is on and Keith Winstead is on. And um, Marsha's right there in Washington, DC, very deserving of, of um, um, 
being able to share and talk about the, the monument, the um, Eleanor Norton Holmes, you know, has suggested that it be removed. There's also um, that was submitted to Congress last year and with the change of Congress, of course, that bill stalled and it's not proceeded any further at this time. We did try to start a GoFundMe and we had a, some funds um, raised, but um, since it is a federal, it's um, covered under the national parks, it cannot be removed without an act of Congress. Well, maybe Keith or, or your other guests can explain exactly what sort Mar of uh, comments. You, can Marcia speak up and unmute herself yeah. and she can tell what's currently? There's Keith. Yeah, and maybe Keith can explain exactly what sort of uh, misunderstandings there are now um, among yeah, I, groups that want to take it down. I think if people knew the story behind Archer Alexander, that they wouldn't be against removing the uh, statue. Because people who go past the statue, they see a black man kneeling and, uh, and, and Abraham Lincoln standing up and they think he's being subservient, but he's not. He's breaking the chains from his ankles and he's in the process of standing. And, uh, and there was a book written, uh, and they talked about Abraham Lincoln, where a slave came up to him, and uh, and he said uh, he was so happy that Lincoln freed him that he got on his knees and he kissed Lincoln's feet. And Lincoln said, no, you don't kiss my feet. The only one you kiss is God. And uh, so that, that's what Lincoln said. So Lincoln... Lincoln, uh, you know, he, he, go ahead. That was after the fall of Richmond when yeah. Lincoln visited it and it had happened and it was reported in the newspapers. And at the time there was an image that was circulated greatly and it shows a slave rising just in very, very similar pose to Archer. And that was published extensively in the newspapers right right before uh, Lincoln's assassination. And, and was the, uh, the statue itself, the uh, configuration, uh, you, you mentioned that it was uh, paid for um, by, I guess, former slaves um, for the funding, but uh, the actual artistic part of it, you know, with Lincoln and with Archer. Well, Alexander, who, who decided that? And Well, actually, when she had the suggestion, and it was so well known, and there was so much circulation looking for the funds for it, um, there were other monuments being suggested. And actually, Thomas Ball, who is the sculptor in Boston, knew William Greenleaf Elliott. And William Greenleaf Elliott, um, and he knew each other, Thomas Ball was a resident of Boston and um, of that area. He had, was living there actually during the Civil War. It was afterwards that he had studied in, um, in Italy earlier and that he had moved on uh, to Florence, Italy. In um, 1869, um, at that point, Elliot knows that the funds um, um, are have been so much have been raised, and he actually goes and visits um, with the sculptor and tells him what's been going on. And there's a mock up actually done. And um, I know that a subsequent visit was made before 1876 by um, Elliot's two sons to Ball um, to make sure that everything looked right on Ball's monument. Uh, if anybody has any additional questions, feel free to raise your hand too. We do have um, one question in the chat about uh, what Archer did after he was uh, free. Uh, did he stay in St. Louis and what, what did he do with uh, wherever he was and with the people that... Uh, when he was first freed in 1863, he was still very much endangered. 
And that's another um, story. At that point, he was um, secretly um, hidden in Alton, Illinois. And he lived over there and worked and was able to raise funds in order to come back um, before even 1865 when we did our Emancipation Proclamation. But and Elliot knew that that was about to happen. And um, Archer, according to Elliot, Archer paid a German um, some funds to secretly um, get his wife and one of their daughters out of um, pit, um, pit. She was a slave of the Naylor family and get her brought to St. Louis. So um, they joined him and two other daughters uh, joined him. And they were, um, after the uh, Civil War ended, able to finally start um, a bit of their own home. And his wife, uh, Louisa, um, there's a big mystery of, of, of that, of her history. And we don't know exactly for sure where she's buried because according to Elliot, she um, was enticed to go back to Naylor and retrieve some of her belongings when Archer and um, Elliot had asked her not to, and she did so, and two days later, she was dead. So there's no mention of where she was buried. I have a very good idea, but I have no proof of that. And um, it's a, a, a sad story. So Elliot did remarry um, a woman named Julia, who he is buried with um, when he died. She died in 1879, and he died in 1880. Uh, wait, what was uh, the cause of her death? Uh, do, does anybody know? Nothing other than what I've just uh, shared is shared in Elliot's book. And according to a descendant of a, a James Alexander, which I think is, is, is a different generation than he is um, understands himself to be, um, is all I can explain. Um, according to um, another descendant a na named Errol Alexander, he, he states that um, she was um, bludgeoned by a piece of wood that Naylor's um, wife was mad because she he'd had relations with her and that she killed him. She had died 20 years before. She wasn't even alive at the time. So I don't know how she, um, um, Louisa, died. There's no record. Well, to, um, Bill, did you have any questions? Or John, did you have any questions? Um, you're uh, 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 Doris, wasn't uh, one objection that Ball himself was sort of a racist and he 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 didn't want any uh, African American actually could come live into his apartment? He had to do it from photographs, and so that was one of the objections to the statue. I've heard that, but the problem for me for that is huh. the mock-up that was done preliminary um, of what Ball was suggesting that Elliot took a photograph of back to St. Louis to show the Western Sanitary Commission what Ball was suggesting looks amazingly like Archer already. It is very much the same pose. Um, the difference is, is that um, the enslaved man is in a soldier's kepi cap. Um, I may not be saying that right, but he's in a soldier's cap. And um, there's that difference. And um, there's some difference about the symbols that are actually on the pedestal there on the monument. And other than that, um, they were asked, he was asked to remove the cap and um, he was supposedly then given um, the photograph of Archer. But like I said, um, the preliminary before that, it looked the same face. So I don't know where that comes from. Oh, and by the way, in the Ken Burns thing, they uh, obviously talk about Muhammad Ali being named after uh, his father, Cassius uh, Marcellus Clay, the abolitionist. They don't mention Archer. Though. 
No, they, they <laughs> did not. Um, um, and it is the uh, Muhammad Ali um, connection to, to Archer because of the Clay family that I know Keith can talk a lot more about because it is um, Henry Clay's own son. Um, Oops. May, may I say something? Um, I don't know if you can hear me or not. I'm with the, um, the Civil War Ladies Group that Marsha is a part of, and Marsha portrays Ms. Scott. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry I had to go away to another Zoom meeting and just came back after you had finished your presentation, uh, but I will uh, try to catch it, you know, on the recording. I just wondered, uh, do we know what the Park Service might be doing now? Uh, Marsha and I had a conversation with them last year, and they said that they were going to have an open forum discussion about the statue and, uh, you know, it being in that place. Of course, we never heard any more of that, and we placed the question to them again, uh, and I don't have a response yet because it's only been a day or two. But the, one of the problems we had was this, the signage is not complete, um, you know, at the, at the site itself. Uh, if there was better signage and um, that people could understand as, as you presented, uh, you know, about what it means. Really, we think that uh, more people would come to, to, to its defense to be there. Uh, has anyone approached a Congresswoman uh, who apparently lives near that area to uh, talk with her or find out if she would consider speaking with um, some of us who know a little bit more? Doris, uh, you're Doris, you're uh, on mute. Uh, my mistake there. Um, not uh, and not recently. We had hoped that Marcia might be able to tell more about current, but currently it's it's been very very quiet. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with you that there needs to be more signage and an an explanation and and the story. I I I think it needs more than that though because. There is a plaque on the side that explains that it is the former enslaved who even paid for it. And yet people never seem even aware of that. So there's a lot more need for education about the monument. I totally agree. And uh, Keith, have you talked with anybody in, in recent months that knows anything about the monument? Not, not recently. Uh... But, you know, when you were talking about uh, Muhammad Ali, named after his father, his father was Cassius Clay. And his father's uncle was named Cassius Clay, too. So, you know, I know he's a junior, but uh, his uh, great uncle was named Cassius Clay. And then uh, his, uh, his father's grandfather was named John Henry Clay. And he was a son. He was the... Uh, slave of Henry Clay Jr. And when he went to the war in Mexico with Henry Clay Jr. And when Henry Clay Jr. was killed, uh, John Henry Clay removed his body from the battlefield. And that was told to me by uh, Muhammad Ali's uncle. And he also gave me a picture of John Henry Clay. And uh, Right now, you know, there was a newspaper article in 1980 where Muhammad Ali's aunt, Eva Clay Waddell, was being interviewed, and she said that her father told her that he was the grandson of Senator Henry Clay. So, you know, that's, that's something we're working on now. Well, that, that's uh, very interesting because we do have this Doris said Elliot's um, material, but um, there's a lot of material that's just been passed down by word of mouth, and and hopefully that could, that's been collected or it's been memorialized somewhere or will be. Um, but but Doris or Keith, is there uh, anywhere that um, there's more than just the written material from Elliot that's being 
uh, that's being preserved or researched? Oh, um, I don't rely on that. In fact, <laughs> as Keith knows, when the very when we first began, there were so many times that people that we would talk about things and I'd go, where'd you get that? But um, my research has gone more into, um, for instance, the um, family um, that brought Archer Alexander to Missouri, they kept a journal. We do know what families they were, who the slaves were in that caravan, where they stopped, where they stayed, um, which is how we know where um, Keith's um, ancestor was dropped off. Those kind of things are what I base the, the, the story on. And the military records and the depositions um, that I've uncovered and the National Archives are how I tell the story now about Pittman and how he tried to catch up with Archer. And there's, there's so much even more to that story in the sense of, um, I do know the name of the individual that he told it to. And I, I, I know that there was another slave even that um, was involved that seems to have just totally disappeared. And so the, all of that um, are records that you have to glean through other sources other than Elliot's book. Um, letters between Jesse Benton Fremont and Elliot discussing the book. Those are how one has to really dig and understand the story. Elliot told what he could, but it wouldn't have been published at all. And we wouldn't know anything of this man's story if it hadn't been for that. Elliot did a lot with the Western Sanitary Commission. And I see the question there, what did the commission do to help the African-Americans? There were many contraband camps, especially in Missouri, but, um, and as far south as into Arkansas and Pocahontas and that. And the Western Sanitary Commission um, raised hundreds of thousands of dollars and supplies, and they would be um, shipped, cargoed out from Boston and, and from the East and from all over the United States to St. Louis, and they would be distributed to these contraband camps um, to help them, food and supplies and clothing. Um, many of the um, U.S. colored troops were um, very aware of all of the things that the Western Sanitary Commission was doing for their families and for fugitive slaves and the way they were helping them. That's why the uh, U.S. colored troops that when the monument, uh, the idea for the monument came about, there was almost immediately $12,000 raised just by U.S. colored troops out of Natchez. And that was amazing. And it got to where the um, their officers said, you know, slow down, you know, let others give. But um, we all know how reconstructed and destruction changed things and, and things changed. And by, um, by 1870, 1869, things were going by the wayside um, for that idea. And if Elliot hadn't pushed um, and, and said, you know, what does it take? How much more money? Um, is this good? And gotten uh, Ball to actually agree for the amount raised to actually cast the monument, it probably wouldn't have happened. Elliot also had planned because he felt so strongly about this story that he wanted to see a monument made for Archer here in St. Louis and um, unfortunately died before funds could be raised and that um, monument could be placed. It would be, and I guess this is an apt thing to say at seven o'clock in St. Louis on the night of a Cardinals game. Ironically, it would have been, um, as Elliot said, where, um, where the prison was that Archer was thrown into that night. That prison uh, to, is the, called the Gratio Street Prison. And today it is um, where the Cardinal Stadium is. So that's how history has forgotten a lot of these things. We do have a great monument to Dred Scott in front of the old courthouse um, in downtown St. Louis. But um, there's a lot of, um, of our history that we still need to work on here 
about placing monuments and recognizing too, not just in Washington, DC. Well, I see uh, David Kent, if you could open your mic and uh, present your comment there, I think that would be very helpful. And um, just uh, before uh, David speaks, um, there's another, is there a duplicate monument uh, or is this the only one or is there? There, no, was, there was a monument also in Boston and uh, the Boston Arts Commission did re remove it to storage. <laughs> it's in storage and um, they have left the base in place and they're working on educational material and signs around it. I don't know, perhaps they're waiting for a more proper time or a more proper setting. Um, there have been many individuals that have formed a committee here in Missouri and we have contacted Boston and uh, said, we'd be glad to take it off your hands. So apparently it was not on National Park Service land no. requiring a congressional act. Um, no. And how big is the monument? I had sad to say, I know many have probably visited it, but how, uh, how tall is just the statue itself, not the pedestal? Um, it's big. <laughs> uh, eight, eight feet, eight or nine feet. Oh, okay. Above the pedestal. The pedestal without the pedestal. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Without the pedestal. The pedestal is about the same height. Okay. Uh, David, do you want to explain uh, what you were uh, talking about in your in your chat about what the Lincoln Group is doing? Yeah, I was just writing um, because uh, people mentioned the uh, last year and and the trying uh, there was a push to try to pull down the statue last year in the midst of all of the uh, protests that were going on last year, and um, if people took exception to the the art artistic elements of the statue. Um, and the Lincoln Group and uh, Pat Tyson was down there and um, uh, Nathan Richardson that plays Frederick Douglass was down there. And there were some other groups also that were down there. And they, we, we essentially had two teach-ins. One, the first one was um, a little bit more argumentative because the people who were protesting yeah. who wanted to pull it down um, you know, we're also there making their their uh, very loud arguments for for why it should be pulled down. Um, and we we were there, the Lincoln Group and, and these other people. I mean, there are plenty of people down there uh, talking about uh, the history of it, bringing out the, the fact that uh, former slaves had paid for it. And Frederick Douglass was a speaker and and all of that information. So. Um, Eleanor Holmes Norton had submitted last year, as, as Dora said, a bill to have it removed because it has to be removed by congressional act because it's a, a National Park Service area. Um, and those, you know, ended when the, the term ended. But she uh, she submitted uh, that bill and uh, a couple other bills for a couple other statues. I can't remember what they were um, early this year. Uh, she resubmitted them and they have just gone into the black hole that is, you know, the the, the committees that uh, are supposed to look at them. But the last I heard, there wasn't any action on it. So this is an area that I, I the Lincoln Group has looked at and wanted to keep in touch with. And so we're going to we'll follow up with Eleanor Holmes Norton's office and try to find out what's going on. And to what what Pat Tyson said. Um, see if there's an opportunity to uh, have another, uh, you know, teach-in type of thing at the park, and make sure everybody understands about the history of the of the statue. And uh, you know, I don't know who that might involve, but maybe we can get Doris out here to to talk about Archer Alexander and and you know, Frederick Douglass and and the others that were down there were quite effective and. And uh, keeping down the the, uh, the the violent energy of the crowds, so uh, uh, I think we we could probably do something like that again. But uh, but I you know it's been on my list of things to do, and I just haven't. But we'll we'll do that. And the Doris, I guess you're going to talk to us in January, so we'll there's we'll have, we'll have something good by then. There was a cousin that came down from New York, Cedric, um, who had actually um, attended that night too. And you see him in a lot of pictures with a megaphone. And 
he may look like one of the uh, um, uh, <laughs> antagonistic people, and he was actually there uh, supporting his ancestor and, and trying to make everybody understand. Um, yes. Keith's family and I have, have discussed this. We have had um, private conversations and, and discuss this. Um, with the uh, Alexander family um, descendants have um, been divided themselves ab amongst themselves about the subject. So um, I'm hoping that um, when the book is finished, we can use it to help raise funds for um, a monument to Archer here in St. Louis too. Um, he's buried in an unmarked grave. However, the cemetery, now that we know where he is buried, um, has given the family um, a very, very um, wonderful, prominent location to erect a monument here. Well, Doris, maybe that's that's the thing, uh, what you're doing it with your work and having Zoom meetings like this is, is helping get the word out and so that people really understand the the background uh, and the substance of the of the monument, but also the history of Archer Alexander to. to uh, I, I just add to what David had to say. Uh, I, I was there too, and I even got my picture with Nathan Richardson in front of the monument. But he he was quite effective actually uh, explaining the thing. You know, he's the guy who does uh, Douglas, and. Yeah, that's uh, good. I, my wife and I walk by there all, it's part of our walk, you know, because we're not that far away. And at the time it was all fenced in and everything. And that's luckily come down and there hadn't been any more threats recently against it. So at least right now, things are sort of back to normal with it. David, I, I, it's sort of, I, I say it scares me sometimes to think about talking to, um, Miss Holmes, because I almost feel like I it, maybe it's fallen off of her radar too, and it's like don't disturb the us. <laughs> well, and one of the reasons why we we haven't been more uh, forthright about doing it is that there's a difference of opinion within our group as well you as know. to whether we want to just let sleeping dogs lie or whether we <laughs> want to you know be be proactive. I'm more the proactive person and and trying to yeah. you know, do something about it before. Before we get surprised, um, but but there are others who who would kind of like keep a low profile and and hope nothing happens. Um, I've worked in Washington D.C. for long enough to know that that's dangerous. <laughs> well, it, it's one thing to have uh, take action against people that are right at the statue and protesting and trying to take it down, yeah. um, and that's that definitely needs to be done. But uh, long range up the up the river. Um, what can be done in order to get the word out so that um, people don't go down there, but people, you know, would support the, uh, support the statue. David, I'd like to ask you, I, I know you're closer there and I have others there that have talked about this. I mean, there's been discussion about erecting another monument um, in addition, and I know the park real well. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful park. And it's got Mary Bethel there and, and that. There's plenty of um, um, location and opportunity to, to create another monument that helps to tell the story. Is there still any discussion about that? There's been discussion, but nothing serious. Um, as, as I mentioned with the park service, it's very difficult to take something away, it's also difficult to put something in. So mm -hmm. they, they can't do either and without a congressional act. And with, uh, you know, everybody knows how, how quickly government moves. Um, when it takes something away, it could go fast. When it's trying to do something, put something in, it, could, it takes forever. So there, it would be a decade to uh, get agreement to put a, a statue in, then, get agreement on what kind of statue, designing a statue, and then building a statue. I mean, it, it would take a long time. And, and I, I, I think that's the way to go, is to, is to do that. We've well, had plenty actually, of suggestions you, you, what you to know, do. You know, you know that Douglas himself suggested putting a statue of Grant there. 
of course, Grant was in the audience at the time, too. It's when they dedicated it. But even Douglas said they should put another statue in there. You know, I, I have heard along those same lines, David, um, John, um, the statues being removed from Richmond, that they are uh, looking at different designs for statues, just as uh, Doris is suggesting. That tells a little bit more about the story and, uh, and is, it has an artistic configuration that's a lot different but um um yeah maybe Richmond that's city the property and they can they can move a lot faster right than the... right and hopefully we have some artists out there that would um uh be interested in uh making suggestions i know that uh, gary castile is a sculptor that does the lost wax method and of course um maybe we do have some sculptors that could give some some ideas I just wanted to say there's been a, a lot of support too um, from Lexington and um, Rockbridge County in Virginia too, where Archer was born. And the family is um, involved. Um, the owners of the, the Alexander family and them um, have met with Keith in that. And they've been very, very supportive in us telling this story. John uh, Anderson, do you have, uh, you want to, Go ahead and raise your comment. Uh, yeah, uh, out here in California, um, in Golden Gate State Park, um, what almost a year ago, I guess, statue of Ulysses S. Grant was uh, essentially vandalized. You know, it was effectively a political vandal vandalization, is what I would call it. And uh, so, it, uh, it it the statue was. Um, taken into possession by the quote unquote arts council. Um, uh, I tried to at least try to find out where, where the statue was because I'm part of the Ulysses S. Grant Monuments Association. And I live out here in the Bay Area. <laughs> and of course, nobody would re return a phone call or, or, or anything like that. But I think that the bigger problem here is everybody should know who Ulysses S. Grant is. And uh, so this educational problem, it's not so arcane, uh, you know, it, to, to, the, to the average person as some of these other statues and the stories that will legitimately need to be told, um, as in the case with, with Archer. But uh, this is very troubling because I don't really think education is going to mean a whole lot because in this particular case, um, it's pretty clear um, uh, who General Grant was and, and you know, it could arguably, uh, uh, you know, we could have this debate, of course, uh, that he may be more responsible for the actual freeing of the slaves, you know, than Lincoln, of course. So um, anyway, I just wanted to make that comment. It's, it's a very bad problem. Yeah, that was why Douglas suggested they put a statue of Grant there. <laughs> it, it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, if we could find the one out here in San Francisco. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> well, it's, uh, I'm sure it's under protection. I know the uh, uh, Cincinnati House in D.C., they, they removed their statue of Washington because of concerns about uh, vandalism. Well, we, we, we just moved it out of the front. It's, it's, it's still there, but it, they just moved it right off the front lawn. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm a little I... concerned about the, these art council folks because I don't really think they're the right people to be in possession of some of these statues. And uh, they seem to be, yeah, at least out here, I, I don't think it's on their uh, radar screen at all. Uh, and so it's, it's troubling, actually. Well, that's the re that reminds me who should be responsible. And, uh, and um, th that goes to the question of getting input from people who should be responsible. You know, there was the discussion about the signage. And if there's an issue with the signage, we need to get some input about what needs to be there. Um, and so that uh, we can address any issues about, about the lack of signage or the signage that exists not being accurate. That's a problem because a lot of times these groups are, they're private groups or they're government groups and they, they don't bring historians in on on these discussions, which is, is not a good good idea when you're talking about history. Um, I had a question for Doris. You're, you're working on a book, right? 
about Archer Alexander. What's the timing on that? It's still in process uh, for the, uh, uh, it's, I've had some health issues recently, David, and it's, it set me back a bit, but um, I'm hoping to have it done this winter. Well, I, I hope we haven't uh, kept you from it, uh, David. I, uh, I scooped up Doris when I heard about her book. I knew she would be hard to get once her book is out. <laughs> and so I wanted to schedule her right away to, to get it. But if there's anything uh, any of our group members can help, um, if you need something in Washington um, or if you're traveling here, I know that there are folks as, you know, John Willen was just discussing, he has uh, access to places and things and people that uh, a lot of people don't. So um, if you need any help with your book on the research or any other part of it, uh, please feel free to, to reach out. We'll see what we can do to get you connected with the right people. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we, uh, and if there are no other questions, we should, there's uh, some of us here that need to go eat some dinner. Um, Doris, great job. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you, Doris. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you great job. Much. Okay. Well, I'll see you all in January and maybe I'll have more progress to report. Mm -hmm.